This episode of Midco Sports Magazine is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Hello, welcome again to Midco Sports Magazine. We've got stories from the Dakotas and around the region of people and places that you know of, but it's athletes and events that are a little off the regular radar. This month, a couple of stories of strength from struggle. We have a man from Madison, South Dakota. His muscles don't always work the way they're supposed to due to disease, but he has run over those roadblocks to be one of the best in America in his sport. And we'll go to Northeast South Dakota to meet a woman who has lived an extraordinary life. She has set world speed records and has not let what some call a disability slow her down. But we start in Manchester, Iowa, and a thing called a Whitewater Park, and some outdoor enthusiasts here in Sioux Falls who want to try to get one built along the Big Sioux River. Here is David Brown with that story. It's ironic that on the calmest of days, the rage of the river can almost be serene. But this isn't whitewater heaven, it's Iowa. We all liked our town, we all knew it was a good place. We wanted to take it a step up and make it a great place. Manchester, Iowa is not a town big on numbers. Its population is a mere 5,100, and it's situated about 150 miles northeast of Des Moines. But the smallest number, six, represents the number of drops in the city's new Whitewater Park that opened in June. They're kind of coming up all over the country. There are some in Iowa and Minnesota. And it is uh, kind of a man-made park where they put obstacles in the water to create the white water. And then you can do time races or you can practice rolling and just have some fun and experience with the white water. Uh, the first time the idea was brought up, there was a lot of questions and a lot of concerns, uh, whether it was the, the liability or the safety or even just who's going to go out there in the water or what, what's it going to bring to town. And we had a number of public meetings. And I think through those public meetings, we, we provided enough information and educated enough people and answered enough questions that provided that support. Remember how Manchester wasn't a town big on numbers? Well, there is one number that was nearly as jarring as these rapids. The price tag, nearly $2 million. A third of that came through state grant monies. A third of it came through the city and the county. The city chipped in $600,000. Delaware County chipped in $50,000. And then the remaining third was raised by uh, private donations. Engineer Ryan Wicks believes despite the apparent gap between a 5,000 person town and a nearly multi-million dollar project, part of the reason this park was built was due to the economic revenue it'll bring back to Manchester. Wicks says the project should pay for itself within three years. We can become a destination for people throughout the Midwest, uh, for uh, people who are avid play boaters, but also just people who will enjoy the river a great fishing opportunity, so we thought this is something that uh, is a little new still to the area and that if we, if we get going and jump on this idea, we can get out at the forefront. Got a spot for you going? Yeah, just straight over by that tree will work. While the waves of change are already in motion in Manchester, a city with a population 30 times larger hopes to make an even bigger splash. The more white water parks that come up in the area, the more the city is going to be like, hey, we need to, to get these people here because those white water parks are making close to a million dollars in economic income every year. Mitchell Joldersma is the president of the Sioux Falls Whitewater Park nonprofit organization, and he hopes to turn the Big Sioux River into an even bigger playground. Well, it's in the heart of uh, Sioux Falls. It goes all the way around Sioux Falls. That's our biggest asset, why not take advantage of it and use it? Mitchell's been trying to raise both awareness and funding for the project for more than a year, and he's taking a strategic approach toward battling through the current of logistics and feasibility studies. We have kind of five spots picked out, uh, more ideal spots with a good elevation and everything. Uh, this is one of the spots where we're currently at, Farmfield Park off uh, Western 57th. 
Uh, our engineers also decided to look at right below Falls Park after the dam. We also have Rotary Park that they're going to look at and Paisley Park that they're going to look at and Lean Park. At this point, however, there are far more rapids ahead for the group. In addition to figuring out the best place to put the Whitewater Park, the project also needs approval from the city, along with purchasing various permits from the Game, Fish, and Parks Department, the Department of Natural Resources, and FEMA. In other words, a Sioux Falls Whitewater Park is currently at the source of the river, just beginning the flow. I just like the thrill. You go and go through it, you hit a hole, all of a sudden you get bombarded with just a big splash of water or a huge wave hitting you and you're like kind of seeing oh where am I now and it's just a big sense of like I don't know it just gets your adrenaline going and it's really exciting I think. If you live here in town it's a good opportunity to, uh, you don't have to drive very far you come down and load right at the uh, number of kayak uh, put in points uh, it's easy. The white water will always rage to those who are experienced it's a calming sensation but for those who are heading down the river, it can be a bumpy ride. Manchester, Iowa has made it through the rough, but if Sioux Falls hopes to follow the same path, they'll need to steady the boat. I think it can happen in any size community. Um, I do think it takes an effort to focus on improving your river. Uh, it takes an effort where people want to do that, um, and it does take some education. Joined by David Brown now, and this, this would be very cool. So give us an update on uh, where the Sioux Falls project is at right now. Well, the Sioux Falls Whitewater Park Organization, the nonprofit that you saw in the piece, they just raised enough money to conduct a feasibility study, and they're looking at five locations, including right here at the corner of 26 and Southeastern at Rotary Park, and the results of that study are gonna be known in a couple of weeks. All right, Manchester built those. Uh, theirs for about 1.8 million. What would it cost to build one in Sioux Falls? Mitchell Joldersma, who you saw in the piece, Tom, he believes it's only going to cost $500,000. And of course, he would like a little bit of help from the city of Sioux Falls, but they still got to look at things. He's got to get money for permits from different organizations. So it remains to be seen if this project can go forward, but it's still moving ahead. All right. David Brown, thanks. Well, when we come back, cerebral palsy could have put an end to his running days, but Austin Handley has taken it all in stride to be one of the nation's best. Midco Sports Magazine on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back to Midco Sports Magazine. We love stories about fighters, athletes who won't back up and won't back down. And our next story focuses on a young man from Madison, South Dakota, who has run over some huge obstacles to become a national champion. Alex Heiner has his story. It's a Wednesday afternoon, and Austin Handley is running. For this 20-year-old from Madison, South Dakota, it's something he does six days a week, 52 weeks a year. That's because running has gone from being a part of Austin's life to being his livelihood, his career. And yet, unlike most professional athletes, Austin's ascension to the top of his sport wasn't where he saw his life going. Weeks after helping Madison High School win a state Class A cross-country title his senior year, Austin was set to enter the military. But during the enlistment physical, doctors took notice that something wasn't right. They caught me on I could not touch my fingers as well as I should have in my right hand. That led to me having to go to a neurologist. There I found out that I had a cyst on my brain. In the end, we found out that this was a result of a stroke I had before I was born. I have been diagnosed with what is called cerebral palsy, and that affects the entire right half of my body from the head, from head to toe. Uh, it affects my motor function and my uh, muscular strength and uh, definition. The diagnosis prevented Austin from joining the armed services. He was told the disorder's continuing effects on his body would stay with him for the rest of his life. But despite the news, Austin's positive outlook never wavered. A lot of people came up to me, you know, they're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was surprisingly calm. I was very like, you know, I'm going to be okay. I've made it 18 years. People say that with cerebral palsy, lots of people struggle to walk and talk. And here I am. I just won my fifth state championship, so don't feel bad for me. I'm doing just fine. I knew there was something to be done with it, that I had faith that, you know, 
you're going to use this somehow. It made no sense at the time what was going on, but in some way it was going to be used for a good thing. And a year or two, you know, a year, year and a half later, we found that. That switch from curse to life-changing blessing started to take shape the following year at college. Austin was competing as a distance runner at Southwest Minnesota State when the idea of the Paralympics first came up. We actually watched the 2012 Olympics and, you know, I was like, I can run that time. You know, I can do that. I can be right up there. And so at that point, it was kind of like, let's search this out. Austin's search led him to be placed in the T37 Paralympic class for track and field athletes with cerebral palsy and other impairments that affect movement. Once classified, Austin submitted his times from his freshman track season at SMSU, marks that were good enough to qualify him for the 2014 national meet in California. Once there, in his first Paralympic meet, Austin made the most of his opportunity. In the 1500 in my class, I um, won and won nationals and really that's when I kind of figured out, man, we can uh, really fill a spot for the U.S. team. Austin's choice to pursue his dream of running for Team USA has meant leaving home for months at a time to train at the National Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista, California. He's also had to forgo his final two years of collegiate eligibility to turn pro, a difficult decision, but one he doesn't regret. I just had to go and be like, make my decision and not look back, otherwise I might, you know, think twice. This summer, Austin won his second national title in the 1500 meters and added a championship in the 800 as well. He's now the American record holder in both events and is ranked in the top five in the world in his class. It might not be the path he thought life would take him on, but it's been a run Austin wouldn't change. Really, it's about going and pursuing what you love, and that's what I'm here to do. And joined now by Alex Heinert. An incredible story, most amazing to me is he had big plans and found out late in life that he had this condition. He had to change his life plans, really, yeah, didn't testament he? Testament to this kid and just his character, his ability to just take what life handed to him and make the most of it. Just a great uh, yeah, example of rising above circumstances and making the best of something that was a tough situation. And he has some big competition coming up here before long. Yeah, he does. Leaving in a couple days for Toronto, he's representing the U.S. at the Parapan Games, the Pan Am Games for the Paralympics. And then if things keep going well, he keeps staying healthy and running good times is going to be competing hopefully in Brazil in 2016 in the Paralympics. Sweet. We wish him the best. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Well, up next on Midco Sports Magazine, life in the fast lane with a national treasure who now lives in Northeast South Dakota. Fast times with Kitty O'Neill coming up next. Midco Sports Magazine on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Welcome back. Kitty O'Neill has spent a lifetime running ahead of the pack. She's been a model for a Barbie doll, she's been a stunt woman in Hollywood, and she is a world speed record holder. Jay Elson has her incredible story. Nestled into the landscape of North Central South Dakota is a small town with a unique name. As its posted population suggests, lightly traveled streets and sidewalks are as normal in Eureka as the annual wheat harvest. Socially, this place is about as far away from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood as a person can get, and that's just fine for one of the town's highest profile residents. Unlike most people in Eureka, Kitty O'Neill's story didn't start here, and considering the road she's traveled and the falls she's taken, not many could have guessed it would end up here either. O'Neill wasn't reconnecting with roots or chasing some job. She just wanted peace and quiet. I got tired of living in LA. I don't like big city and committed people. So I moved over here and I fell in love with the people. It was so pretty. They were very family oriented. I like that. The opening chapter of Kitty's story set the tone for her improbable journey. She was born on March 24, 1946, in Corpus Christi, Texas. Five months later, life took its first turn. I had my kids in my box, and my high fever killed my dogs. That's how I became deaf. 
Despite her hearing loss, O'Neill's mother was determined to give her daughter a normal childhood. She refused to let Kitty learn sign language and instead helped her develop and understand speech through lip reading. She also encouraged her daughter to remain active. So when Kitty began showing an interest in diving, she was prepared to do anything to support her. In 1962, Kitty and her family moved to Anaheim, California, so she could train with two-time Olympic gold medalist Sammy Lee. It was under his tutelage that O'Neill became one of the top young divers in the country. By 1964, she was training for the Olympics herself when her life changed course once again. Then I broke my wrist. So I had a spinal meningitis after that. I got sick so I started all over again. And I got bored. So I wanted to do something fast, speed, motorcycle, water skiing, boat, anything. She'd end up doing a little of everything. But her first real dose of adrenaline came in 1970 when she set the women's water ski speed record at 104.85 miles per hour. The emotion, the feeling that you had when you set a record, how did that feel to you? Pretty. Thrill. Feels good. The speed, so you get a big ghost bump. I love it. From there, Kitty's quest for thrills intensified. She dabbled in motorcycle and off-road racing, even competing in some of the sport's most grueling events, such as the Baja 1000 and Mint 400. But it wasn't long before her unending desire to go bigger led her in yet another new direction. In the mid-1970s, she met a man that would eventually help vault her to celebrity status. That man was Hal Needham. And he happened to be the top stuntman in Hollywood. So he told me about his stunt. I said, what? What stunt is? He said, I'm going to train you. Okay, here I am. I don't know what that means. Not only did Needham get Kitty into the movie business, he also helped her become the first woman to join Hollywood's most exclusive stunt group, Stunts Unlimited. It was at that point that O'Neill's career really and quite literally blew up. From car crashes to explosions to death-defying falls, O'Neill made a living laughing in the face of fear. Movies like Airport 77, Smokey and the Bandit 2, and The Blues Brothers. TV series such as Beretta, The Bionic Woman, and Wonder Woman. All of them put Kitty in some sort of precarious situation, but she never backed down. No stunt was too big. It's all I can feel. I'm afraid of anything. You do it. Feel it's going to be finished. I have a lot of faith with God. Kitty may not have approached a stunt with any kind of fear, but that doesn't mean she was never afraid. In August of 1977, she became the fastest woman on water when she piloted a jet-powered boat named Captain Crazy to a record speed of 275 miles per hour. But once was enough. But one way is okay. But the second time, ah, uh, I said, no, thank you. The woman do it again. I said, no. He's just driving like, driving in the ice. I can't control. But then I speed, that's me, I can't control. Ironically, Kitty's closest call would occur on land less than a year later. In March of 1978, she climbed behind the wheel of this rocket-powered Corvette funny car for a TV special called Super Stunt 2, which was narrated by Golden Globe-winning actor Rock Hudson. He, along with a national TV audience, watched as Kitty's run came to a very violent end. But she's going too fast to stop! Fortunately, they didn't all end like that. In fact, two previous turns behind the wheel were extremely successful. On June 7, 1977, Kitty clocked the quickest quarter mile in history at 3.22 seconds with a top speed of 412 miles per hour. 
but it was the record she set just six months earlier that would be her most celebrated achievement. In December of 1976, Kitty climbed into the cockpit of the hydrogen peroxide-powered three-wheeled rocket known as the SMI Motivator. On her first attempt, she ran an average speed of 512.710 miles per hour, shattering the previous record for women by 200. Wow. You're not fast enough. You're gonna go faster, faster. But Kitty would never reach those speeds again. In fact, she slowed down considerably. She retired from the stunt and land speed business in 1982 and ultimately made the move to Eureka 11 years later. A corner of the town's Pioneer Museum now holds the pieces that remain from her former life. And it was in this very spot that Kitty was introduced to the latest land speed sensation, another woman with South Dakota ties. And you had a visitor last year, Jesse Combs. Yeah, South Dakota, yeah. And she came up here to tell you that she's gonna try and break that record. What, what do you think about that? I'm proud of her. I'm happy for her. I'll be to do it again. If you say break the market, then I'll do it again. To challenge. Joined by Jay Elson. And all right, when, when is Jesse going to try to break Kitty's record? Well, a couple of months ago when we first talked to Kitty, we weren't sure. She hadn't really officially announced those plans yet. But since then, she has come out and said September's the time. That's when she's going to go for it. If she gets it, uh, she will be the quote unquote fastest woman in the world. And that's a big deal in the land speed community because Kitty has held this particular record for such a long time. All right. Thanks, man. You bet. Jay Elson. Our thanks to Kitty O'Neill, to Austin Handley, and everyone involved with the Whitewater Project in Manchester and in Sioux Falls. Thanks for watching Midco Sports Magazine. This has been Midco Sports Magazine, presented by Shields and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine.